listen to all of you. Am I audible? So are we ready with the team, IT and all? Good afternoon, Nitin, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, Sir, so actually, uh, Dr. Manoj Gupta sir would not be able to join in today's session. Uh, he okay. has busy in some meeting. Uh, so, in place of uh, Sir, uh, Registrar Dr. Shani he will join us okay. within a few minutes. And uh, uh, Director Admission Dr. Neeraj Jain will be with us. And other panelists huh? are coming. Cool. So, we will uh, wait for five minutes more, then we will start. Sure. And meanwhile, uh, I'll welcome uh, Uvita. I hope she's there. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Thank you. Hi. Hi. My video is off. Wait, I'll hold it. Okay, you will be presenting uh, with the presentation, right? Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, how are you? Okay. I'm good. And you, how are things out there? It's fine. It's pretty controlled here. Yeah. yeah, they they have done pretty strict out there, which I got to know about. Yeah. Still, we need to be safe. Yes, exactly. Hello, Upita, ma'am. Hello. Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Good afternoon, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Preeti Kaushik from this side, from university. How are you, ma'am? Ma your face, uh, ma'am. Fine, uh, fine, ma'am. Your face is not visible, ma'am. Uh, because my video is off. Just a moment. Wait. Okay. Yeah, now you can see me. Can you? Hello? Hello, yes, ma'am. Huh. Yeah, now you can see me? Now, now you are, yes, ma'am. Now you are visible. Huh. How about you? I'm, uh, I'm fine. Uh, what about you? <laughs> I'm good, I'm good. Thank you. <laughs> We are just waiting to our two panelists. Sure, no problem.
हाँ हाँ कोई दिक्कत नहीं है दो मिनट बाद एक बार इंट्रोड्यूस करो हेलो 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 नितिन सर नितिन सर लेट मी इंट्रोड्यूस विद द पैनलिस्ट फ्रॉम पीयू यू साइड सर ओके टुडे वी हैव डॉक्टर चानी रूपानी मैम रजिस्ट्रार फ्रॉम पूर्णिमा यूनिवर्सिटी सेकेंड वन डॉक्टर नीरज जैन सर डायरेक्टर एडमिशन पूर्णिमा ग्रुप थर्ड इज गरिमा माथुर हेड एनी प्लेसमेंट सेल हेलो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी हेलो नितेन सर फो डॉक्टर हेलो प्रिया मैम हेलो डॉक्टर प्रज्ञा मिश्रा कोऑर्डिनेटर एएसआरसी पूर्णिमा यूनिवर्सिटी हाय and fifth one myself dr preeti kaushik dean school of science and humanities punima university hello everyone a very good afternoon to all of you mm -hmm. good afternoon good afternoon to all the good afternoon, afternoon. so sir so should we start the session uh, nitin sir yeah please go ahead opita ma'am opita ma'am yeah yeah sure yeah okay so i welcome you all on the second day of uh, the webinar on glimpses of future prospects and opportunity in science and technology the topic of the today's webinar is medical physics a bridge between physics and medicine today we have uh, ms uptita pandey with us she is certified radiation safety officer with the knowledge of safe handling of radioactive materials so i request to so i request to request to uvita ma'am please start the session ma'am please thank you preeti ma'am and thank you nitin sir for organizing today's webinar and i'm very happy to be here and presenting my views on medical physics good afternoon all let's get started so today i'll be talking about medical physics as i say it's a bridge between physics and medicine so today's webinar is aimed for students so the aim of this web uh, webinar is to guide students who are interested in chehan can you mute your speaker main bol raha hu main speaker on hai apna book wo band kar hello कल बात कर लेंगे। हेलो, आई वुड लाइक टू रिक्वेस्ट ऑल टू प्लीज म्यूट योर स्पीकर्स सो दैट आई कैन स्पीक। आर वी गुड टू गो? ओके। द एम ऑफ दिस वेबिनार इस टू गाइड स्टूडेंट्स हु आर इंटरेस्टेड इन मेडिकल फिजिक्स फील्ड एंड वांट्स टू मेक अ करियर इन दिस एरिया। सो लेट्स गेट स्टार्ट in this next one uh, i will be covering about what medical physics is what is the role of medical physicist the career path to become a medical physicist the clinical aspects of medical physics technologies a medical physicist works with and 
area of research medical physicists are involved in. So what is medical physics? It's the application of physics in medicine, or by definition, you can say that it's a branch of applied physics that uses physics concepts, theories, and principles to healthcare and medicine. And ever since the discovery of X-ray by Ron Gilt in 1895, and the Quirrell's discovery of radioactivity, medical physici physics has played a key catalyst in the evolution of modern medicine. It is the technical foundation of radiation oncology, radiology, nuclear medicine. And when we are dealing with radiation, of course, radiation protection plays an important role in it. And the professionals who work in this field are called medical physicists. So these are the primary areas of medical physics. Radiation oncology, it is the it is involved in the treatment of cancer using radiation therapy. So radiation therapy uses high doses of radiation to target cancer cells in order to kill them or slow their growth. The other important area in the field of diagnostic is radiology, which uses medical imaging to diagnose and treat diseases within the body using the modalities like X-ray apparatus, CT, which is computed tomography and MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. The other important area is nuclear medicine, which is an area of diagnostic imaging that employs a small amount of radioactive material, also known as radiopharmaceuticals, to diagnose, assess, and treat a variety of diseases, such as gastrointestinal, endocrine, or neurological disorders. And apart from these three specialty, which a medical physicist in, is involved in, the mandatory responsibility of medical physicist is radiation safety. He is responsible for the radiation safety, no matter what his specialty is, whether he's from radiation oncology, radiology, or nuclear medicine. All the other professionals rely on the medical physicist for the radiation safety matters, advice, policy making, radiation protection programs, etc. Well, medical physicists work in a multidisciplinary field and what they do has a direct impact on the quality of treatment a patient receives. So here are a few roles of medical physicists. They are heavily involved in the clinical practice and consultation. They are also involved in making radiation protection plan and doing risk management. Also, they provide technical support for therapeutic and diagnostic medical procedures. Medical physicists are also involved in research and development. As medical physics is destined to be ever-changing, it has emerged as a discipline that is responding to technical and scientific problems faced in the medical field, either by developing and introducing new technologies or by discovering and implementing new and existing methodologies. So they are very involved in research and development. The other area they are involved is in teaching, doing teaching in university hospitals, universities. Also medical physicists are involved in policy making for safety of workers and the public. So how to become a medical physicist? Here is a career path. If some of you wants to become a medical physicist in future, one of the main path is that you do a bachelor's in physics or related field in engineering, and then you pursue a career. Then you enroll in a med master's in medical physics or do a PhD if you're interested in research and development. After finishing that, you can either enroll for medical physics residency program, or you can go on the on-the-job clinical training in medical physics. And once you complete the duration of your clinical training or your residency, you are eligible to apply for the certification exam. That's very important to become a certified medical physicist. The other way, if you don't have a 
master's in medical physics, but you have a master's in physics or PhD in physics, you can still go for a medical physics residency program, or you can do a medical physics postdoc and then join clinical training or residency program and follow the same procedure for certification. Let's talk about the scene of medical physicist, physicist certification in India. BARC Power Atomic Research Center and Atomic Energy Regulatory Board, ARB. These are the two certified bodies that provide certification of qualified medical physicists in India. BARC with support from WHO has started the first one year postgraduate diploma in radiological physics since 1962. And here you have two parts which you can take either if you have a phys master's in physics, you can go for this diploma in radiological physics from one of the BARC deemed universities. Or you can, if you have a bachelor's in physics and you want to go directly after that, you can do a two years master program in medical physics by one of the BRC accredited universities. And once you finish your two years masters, you can do a one year internship in hospital to be allowed to sit for a certification exam. And in India, it is one of the prerequisites to enroll in masters of medical physics to have a BSc in physics. If it is like one of the mandatory things. If you don't have a MSc in a BSc in physics, you're not applicable to apply for a master's in medical physics in India. For more details, you can go on the ARB's website and see. These are some other certification boards all around the world. If you're interested in studying abroad and want to go to do your master's in America or Canada, somewhere. So American Association of Physicists in Medicine, AAPM, they are one of the important organizations in the field of medical physics, and they are heavily involved in the research and development in this area. Also, there's American Board of Radiology. There's Commission on Accreditation of Medical Physics Education Program, CAMP. In Canada, they have Canadian College of Physicists in Medicine. In Germany, there's Deutsche Gesellenschaft for Medizinische Physik. In Australia, there's Australian College of Physical Scientists and Engineers in Medicine. And here in Dubai, we have Dubai Health Authority that provides certification for qualified medical physicists who have enough experience and training. Also, the residency period depends on country to country. Like for example, in America and Canada and Germany, they have a two years internship program before you can sit for certification and become a medical physicist expert. In UAE and India, there's one year mandatory internship. So it depends on which country you are doing your training because each country has their own rules and regulations. So let's talk more about clinical medical physicists. The physicists who are involved in clinical practices are called cl clinical medical physicists. And they are heavily involved in working with specific patients in both diagnostics and treatment. One of their main roles is to make sure that all the devices, diagnostic and ther therapeutic devices are operating correctly. And a day-to-day -day job of clinical medical physicist includes performing quality assurance on the treatment machine. For example, checking the calibration, checking the spatial accuracy of the treatment delivery, also checking the quality of the treatment plan developed by the radiation therapist, also be working on managing commissioning of new treatment technologies. They are also involved in quality control of imaging system, designing a new radiation facility. And one of the important roles also is to control radiation hazard. So these are the few day-to-day -day roles of a medical, clinical medical physicist. In medical imaging, they are involved in performing quality assurance to verify whether scanners are operating correctly, 
scanning phantoms for validation of image quality, verifying dosing. In nuclear medicine, they collaborate with physicians in the use of radio tracer, which me measures the physiological process like blood flow, metabolism, and cellular proliferations, check the dose calibrators. So medical physicists work with in our interdisciplinary field, which involves radiation oncologists, nuclear technologists, radiation therapists, radiologists, etc. And here on the right hand side, you can see the brain image from different modalities, like for X-ray, you can see the bones. In CT, you are able to see bone as well as the organs and soft tissues. In MRI, you can clearly see the soft tissues. In MRA, which is magnetic resonance and geography, it's a technique based on magnetic resonance imaging to image blood vessels. And the PET scan here is showing the functionality inside the brain, how the blood flow and everything is going on. So let's talk about more of these modalities, X-ray imaging and computer tomography. This is one of the common treatment methods these days for cancer treatment. And as I already mentioned that the, in 1895, Rongen was the first to use X-ray for imaging. And here you can see the first X-ray image of his wife's hand. Also in 1972, Hounsfield announces his work on CT to generate attenuation map. Hounsfield scale is a quantitative scale for describing the radio density. And it is frequently used in CT systems where it, its value is also termed as CT numbers. Now it is a, a majority of CT system use X-ray tubes although tomography can also be done using a synchrotron or gamma ray emitters as a monochromatic X-ray source. So here you can see one of the CT machines from Siemen on your left-hand side, and on your right-hand side, you can see all the things inside it. So how a CT works, a CT scan is a, it's an imaging procedure that creates cross-sectional images with the help of computer processing. CT images are more detailed than a conventional X-ray image and can reveal bones as well as soft tissues and organs. Well, in, in conventional X-ray, we use a fixed tube that sends X-ray in only one direction. Whereas he, you can see here in the image, here, that it uses, uh, in CT scanner, it uses motorized X-ray sources that shot narrow beams of X-ray as it rotates all around the patient. And there are special digitizable X-ray detectors that are located directly opposite the X-ray source. So as the X-ray passes through the patient, they are picked up by the detectors and transmitted to the computer. Image slices can either be displayed individually in a two-dimensional form or stacked together to generate a 3D image that can reveal abnormal structures to help physician plan and monitor treatment. So the other commonly used modality is magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. Originally, it was known as nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, but the term N was dropped because of its negative association with the word nuclear. In magnetic resonance imaging, we don't use ionizing radiation, we use radio frequency waves. And Paul C. Lotterberg and Peter Mansfield won the 2003 Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine for their discoveries concerning MRI. There are a few important components of MRI that you need to know. Magnet, main magnet, gradient coils, and RF field. 
So here you can see a detailed structure of MRI machine. MRI machines are a powerful diagnostic tools that use strong superconducting magnets and radio waves to generate images of the body's soft tissue. And as we all know that human body is made up mostly of water molecules. So it contains lots of hydrogen atom. These atoms react with MRI's main magnetic field and the radio waves it emits. In the nucleus of every hydrogen atom is a positively charged proton that spins around in excess. Normally, these hydrogen protons spin on randomly oriented axis. But when inside the MRI scan, the patient is, things change. MRI involves powerful magnets, which produce a strong magnetic field that forces in the body to align with that magnetic field at a specific frequency, which is also known as resonant frequency. Well, half of these protons face in the direction of the magnetic field and the other half in the opposite direction of it. The protons lacking a match among oppositely aligned protons are the, are the ones which are targeted by the MRI scanner, which you can see in the machine here. This acts as a radio antenna that transmits and receives radio frequency or RF wave. The MRI technologist uses it to send RF pulses at the resonant frequency of the spinning proton. And when the ra radio frequency coil is turned on, the unmatched protons absorb the energy of the RF wave, which causes them to flip on the axis. They are still in the line of the magnetic field, but then now they are in the opposite direction. So when the RF pulse stops, the proton release the energy and return to their previous alignment emitting signal back to the coil. That signal turns into electric current that the scanner digitizes. The scanner processes the signal using advanced algorithms in order to produce the image. So you can see here in the image, MRI knee image, the tissues with less water in it will have a fewer hydrogen atom to emit signal back to the RF coil. And those areas will appear darker on the MRI scan. So the varying the signal strength get translated into various shades of gray, which appears on the MRI images, which radiologists recognize as different types of tissues in the scan. Now let's talk about nuclear medicine and medical imaging. Here it utilizes radio pharmaceuticals, and uses the radio tracer principle to measure the physiological process. Also radio isotopes used here are produced via accelerators or reactors. Radio chemistry is one of the important area of sciences here, which is involved and is performed to attach the radio isotope to a molecule. And then radi radio pharmaceuticals is injected into the patient and images with SPECT or a PET scanner is taken. So here I'm gonna talk more about positron emission tomography or PET, what it is and how it's done. Well, PET scan uses a radio tracer, as I have already mentioned, to measure body functions such as blood flow, oxygen use, and sugar metabolism. The radio tracer is injected intravenously in, into a patient and is registered by the external detectors positioned at different orientations. Here you can see the patient is placed and there's like millions of gamma ray detectors all around in the form of ring. So the tracer distributes within different tissues according to the carrier molecule and emitter positron the emitted positron travels a short distance before it interacts with a free electron inside the body and an inhalation reaction occurs, resulting in the production of two gamma ray photons of energy 511 keV. 
511 kilo electron volt at almost 180 degree to each other. The gamma rays are easily passed through the body and are detected by the gamma ray detectors of the tomograph and the tomograph software identifies the gamma ray that are coincident. That means those that are likely to originate from the same annihilation event by constructing the positron-electron collision. And then the concentration of radioisotope can be determined. In the reconstructed image, areas of high activity and hence high glucose utilization will appear darker while the areas of lower activity, they appear small, like lighter. Then these are the, some important radioisotopes that are used in nuclear medicine department. We have technetium whose half-life is six hours. And then there's iodine-123, which is used for iodine therapy, gallium-67, indium-111, thallium-201. These are some of the radioisotopes that we use in nuclear medicine. Then let's talk about one of the most common areas of medical physics, which is radiotherapy. Here, the medical physicists are involved in performing quality assurance on sources of radiation, verification of proper dosing. The types of procedures are external beam radiotherapy, which sometimes have gamma, rays, electrons, and the very new one is the proton therapy. And then we have internal radiation therapy, which is brachytherapy. Medical physicists are also involved in treatment planning. So in external beam therapy, it's a method for delivering high energy X-rays or electron beams or proton to a patient's tumor. The radiation is given externally from outside the body, and the beams are usually generated by a linear accelerator and targeted to destroy cancer cells while sparing surrounding normal tissues. That's one of the main goal of radiotherapy is to destroy the cancer cell while mitigating the effect on the normal tissue. We, we try to save as much as normal tissue as we can during the radiotherapy. Also, external beam therapy may be used to reveal symptoms in patients with advanced cancer or cancer that has metastatized. The other area or the other type of therapy is brachytherapy, which is also known as internal radiotherapy. Here we use, it's a form of radiotherapy where we use sealed radiation sources, which are placed inside the tumor area or next to the tumor area that requires treatment. Brachytherapy is commonly used for cervical cancer, prostate, breast, or even skin cancer. It also can be used to treat tumors in many other body sites, but most commonly ones are cervical and prostate and breast. These can deliver high doses to low doses depending on the type of tumor and depending on the type of treatment plan. These seeds, you can see here in the image, these are like very small needles. Sometimes they're in the shape of needles, sometimes they're in the shape of seed. And with the use of tube or catheter, they are inserted inside the body. And they can be left there permanently or they can be left there for temporary time, depending on the site of cancer location and the type of tumor. Other area where medical physicists are involved is radiation safety. They ensure that the use of radiation in hospital are safe for workers, public, and there's no harm to the environment. They closely monitor the radiation level inside the facility. Also, they keep an eye on transport of radiation. They're involved in radioactive waste management. They advise in the use of radioactivity to emergency preparedness and response program. It's kind of related to health physics in sort of way. 
And here is a few of the research areas that medical physicists are involved in. It's, it's a wide range of research area from cancer to heart diseases to mental illness. In cancer, they are mostly involved in the development of new radiation delivery methodologies. Also, how radiation affects the biological process, which comes in the area of radiobiology. Also doing those calculation algorithm and softwares for interfacing. Automation is one of the important area these days. We are trying as much as to do things automated as possible for a better and accurate result and less harm to the staff and patient. Also, there are new technologies involving dual energy CT. We are also working in the area of quantitative and dynamic imaging. Artificial intelligence and deep learning is these days very popular in medical physics and there are many research going on in this area. And one of the newest area of medical physics, which I would like to talk about is radiomics. It's one of an emerging translation field of research aiming to extract a large number of quantitative features from medical images using data characterization algorithms. So it's like really latest area, like started a year or two years back. And radiomics can be performed with tomographic images from CT, MRI, PET studies, also, it's a new field and there are substantial challenges to its implementation in the clinical setting, which are under study these days. So I guess that's the end of my presentation here. I would like to thank you Indian Youth Nuclear Society and Purnima University for inviting me to host this webinar and doing this presentation today. Thank you all. You can ask any questions if you have. Hello, ma'am. Hello. Uh, thank you for this informative session. Ma'am, we have got one question. Uh, what could be the possible side effects of EBT? So, uh, this question has come from one of the students. So, please uh, let us know. Well, the possible side effect of external beam therapy is, like, as I said, damaging the normal tissues because it's it's given from outside the body and when you are doing from outside the body there are chances that the radiation goes more than like outside the tumor area so causing damage to the normal cells that's why internal radiotherapy or brachytherapy it's more precise in its use of radiation because there the radiation is placed near the tumor region. So it's more impactful and less damage to the normal tissue. I hope that solves, yeah. So it can be considered as permanent cure, I think. When we talk about radiotherapy and any sort of such therapies, so we can't be sure that whether the disease well, has been cured or not. There are many cases like after radiotherapy, after two years or three years, the cancer has again emerged you know so we cannot say that it's a permanent cure but of course for it is important mm -hmm. to control the growth of the tumor depending on the shape of tumor and the type like some tumors they reoccur after a few years okay. so i'm not sure whether you can say it like it's a per permanent treatment for anything so what can uh, be the other measures which we should, which we can take, uh, like after getting radiotherapy and all? So can there be other measures, means uh, home remedies or some sort of things, uh, exercises? I'm not very sure about it because I'm not the right person to answer this question. It's more like physician's question. He, 
radiation oncologists, these people can explain you better about all this area. Okay, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, hello, ma'am. Hi, this is Garima Mathur. And uh, I had a question with perspective of our students, like if somebody chooses this as a career, then what are the challenges which they can face as a fresher? Like how to begin and like what, what are the challenges for the students? As I said, in India, one of the challenges, like if you if you have decided to become medical physicist after you finished your bachelor's say in nuclear engineering, in my case, like I did a bachelor's in nuclear engineering, and then I decided to go in the field of medical physics because that's where I find like it's more impactful what I'm doing, and it's I can see the direct effect of what I'm doing on the patient other than like other fields like high energy physics and all that. So in India, you need to have a BSc in physics to be able to do a master's. So that's one of the problems. So if you have a bachelor's in any other area, say biomedical engineering, electronics, you cannot do, you cannot pursue a master's in India. But of course you can go anywhere else in the world. There are scholarships available. You can go to Canada. It's like this. You can speak in English there, so there's no language problem. You can go to Germany or any other European countries, but there you need to learn the language because it's one of the important, right, right. one of the yeah. important thing. Because if you work in France or Germany, say for example, everything is they work in hospital, and they work closely related to the regulatory authorities. So there are a lot of documents and papers which are in their national languages. Like for example, in Germany, it's all in German. So you need to be like very fluent. You need to be like native fluent in German because there are some words which are very technical and you cannot just read it and Google it, you know? That's, that's yeah, not true. gonna save time. So if you are really interested in doing masters outside, I would suggest do it from Canada. It's easier because there's no language problem you can apply for internships, although the education there is expensive in Canada and US, it's expensive compared to the European countries. The fees of European countries are less cheaper. But for students who have BSc in physics and they are in India, they can always go for master's program in medical physics from one of the BARC accredited in university. It is very important to do it from an accredited university so that you can appear for your certification exam because that's very important. That's also one of the things that you need to take under consideration. Take yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Well, plasma therapy is also one of the interesting area, but I'm not like very aware of this field because I don't work in this area. So I cannot be able to answer that question. I'm sorry, but I can search later and send you an email on that. I see one more question. They're asking about COVID. How can, what was the question where it's gone? Well, yes, there are some things that uh, radiation physicists can do because this is the rapid global, the rapid global impact of COVID is unprecedented and unexpected and you can see its impact in every field. So for cancer patients, there is a high chance to catch the virus, you know. And in most of the departments all around the world, the medical physicists, they have direct contact with the patient where in, in various clinical areas, such as brachytherapy, in in vivo dosimetry, motion management, etc., And it's uh, important and essential for medical physicists to stand prepared to support the department to the best of their abilities while minimizing the infection risk to the patient and hospital staff. For example, here in the UAE, they have reduced the patient load because because of the hospitals minimizing outpatient visit, you know, they have their rules and regulations during these times. So some of the areas where medical physicists can contribute in this 
scenario is like they cooperate with the radiologists to develop imaging acquisition protocols for differential diagnosis of COVID-19. Also, they cooperate with radiologists to develop evidence-based quality assurance program for teleradiography. So I've read an article where they use CT to diagnose the lung infection caused by this COVID-19. Also, the other areas they can do is to develop a policy for treatment of patients who are infected with COVID. So there's less harm to the hospital staff and less contamination by the virus. Also, they work closely with the IT teams to create infrastructure for remote medical physics activities like treatment planning, dosimetry, quality control, education and training, etc. But these are just an indicative points and the rest contribution of a medical physicist in this time depends on his or her expertise and also on the country they are working in. So I think that's all. Well, that depends on the physician who is doing it. it. It is harmful. And as we know that the effective dose limit is one millisievert per year for normal patient. So you cannot do it more than a few times, you know. You need to take into consideration the amount of dose you are giving to the patient. So I think that's, it helps to give the answer for her question. Yeah. Well, if you're practicing in India, I know many people who have done the certification in India and are now working in UK, they're working here in Dubai, it is valid. But the problem is if you do it from outside of India and then you want to come and work in India, ARB has a lot of problem with it. And there are a lot of rules and regulations you have to go through. So there's no problem if you have done and worked in a clinical environment in India and then you want to go abroad. It's mostly valid outside the country. But for India, if you come with foreign degree, it's not valid sometimes. So I think that's all. Um, all right. Uh, should we conclude uh, the session? One uh, more question. Uh, a question as a curious one of the curious minds has asked this question that can there be any possibility to have uh, machines to treat uh, diseases like flu and all? Because we are so busy in our lives, we can't spare even three to four days in fever and all. So any That's an interesting to... question, but I, I'm not much aware of it. But yeah, recently there's this company called uh, uh, Commissar in Italy. They have made this sterilization machine where they are sterilizing the mask that we are using these days and of course they are costly not normal people can afford new mask every day so there is this machine but it's pretty expensive and mostly for hospitals to sterilize the mask which can be used like for seven days okay it can be reused so it cuts the cost of hospitals in buying the mask you know and but these masks are only like those F FP2 and 3, I believe, not the normal surgical mask. The special mask like N95, these things, they can be sterilized for next seven days for reuse. But I'm not sure about other devices that can test your immune system and all that. I'm not aware of that. Well, in continu continuation of the same, uh, can uh, we uh, think of certain applications of radiology or the radiations to sterilize or disinfect the PPEs and the mask or the other medical instruments that are used nowadays? Yeah, as I said, this machine is called Decon Box and it's, 
right now they are working on the mask sterilization, but you can sterilize some of the machines or clothing. Still, it's under a study. They are doing some studies, but for now, they are only authorized for sterilizing the mask. Okay. And it's, it's a pretty expensive machine, I say. Yes, proton therapy is one of the new therapies that has come in this area and it's going to be used in hospitals recently, like more often. There are some hospitals which are doing proton therapy, but it's not very used, you know, and it has less, it damages, it deposits deposits less energy as compared to x-rays and it does less damage to the normal tissues compared to x-rays you know so this can be one of the advantages but still some studies are going on in this area to know whether proton therapy is more effective in prolonging the lives you know ma'am one question from my side uh is there any material available to replace damage and uh, or missing body component so that we can help uh, our damaged part of the body or we can uh, use that kind of material in that uh, this type of therapy of course i'm sure there must be a lot of materials available to replace the broken and damaged parts inside the body but i'm not very aware of it because it's not my area of expertise so i'm sorry i won't be able to answer this question Hello. Hello. I think uh, we should continue. I would like to add few things. Uh, thank you, Vida, for thank this. Thank you so uh, much. I hope it is informative uh, and everyone get enough knowledge about the field. Yeah. So there are few questions still left in the chat box. If I can see, I if you go through, through and if you think later, maybe. Okay. Okay, then you can do so. Few things uh, I would like to summarize from the presentation is that, like uh, as Vida has mentioned, X-rays basically give us two D representation of body lesion and body structures, while the CTs, the computer tomographies, give us more three D images because it uh, take images in all three directions and then give us precise location where we can uh, treat the uh, infected area. And there was one question about the permanent treatment of the cancer. I must say uh, the radiation therapy basically treated the, 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 the cancerous cell completely from the very specific part and it is a permanent solution. However, uh, it, it of course damages few good cells in the surrounding but it is still more effective than your chemotherapy yeah, and, all chemo and surgery yeah because uh, the, in in that case your entire body is get affected and uh, when we say the resurfacing of cancerous cells which have been observed in few cases i must say it, it's not like always it resurfaces and comes back it it, it is there in few cases but most of the time, the, uh, the, the, the radiation therapy is pretty much effective in cancer yes. treatment. And um, the one part like sterilization, as I was uh, discussing yesterday as well, radiation are pretty much one of the best things to sterilize medical equipments. And it has already been done uh, in the past as well for all your medical and surgical instrument devices, and yeah. devices they are they are being uh, sterilized using uh, gamma rays and other radiation depending on the type and uh, it, it kills uh, mostly all the bacterias and viruses or any another another body which is uh, on those tools so in that sense uh, sterilization is not a new thing but yes, it, it's now been applied to surgical masks and PPs, PPs because of uh, there was a scarcity of those things in uh, recent time. 
but one thing i want to ask you vida if you can uh, put some light on it earlier if i understand that mri gives you the functional aspect of the body no pet gives the functional aspect of the body and mri gives the more detailed and high quality images of the soft tissues uh, yeah right right so it's and like uh, x-ray is imaging your calcium your bones but mri in mri we image water molecules so yeah. depending on the amount of water molecules you get the x-ray machine as i explained before the whole procedure and then depending on the water molecules where there are less or more the different gray colors in the mri image appears you know yeah so my question is basically is the mri ct and that is that x-ray it it just gives the image of bone because it's you're throwing x-ray in one thing in one direction you know and in ct you get the whole complete anatomic image you know all the structure organs as well as soft tissues and in mri you get soft tissue images of various organs and body parts and in pet it tells you about the functional it gives the functional information about the body like the blood flow metabolism process all this all these things so these are like the basic differences between all these three machines and there are many researches these day going on where they are involving two of the modalities together like for example ct mri fusion imaging and ct and pet fusion imaging so this is also one of the areas where medical physicists are heavily involved and they are working on it and they are also doing it clinically in some of the hospitals yeah actually pet ct and mri ct is uh, already available because yes it's already available you right is that so, we can have two different images and ct gives us the structural yeah uh, image so of the ct body. and ct and pet you can get the structural image as well as the functional, functional right. images yeah. of the body so it's more like more precise information you will get you will know what's going on in the body where the lesion is more exact tumor location it's like localization of tumor as you say yeah so do you think we can have a, a one more complex machine with the mri pet and ct all combined together then we can treat it in a more precise manner damaging the minimal possible to surrounding tissues well of course they must be working on it i'm not doing the research these days i'm more involved in the product and sales part these days and okay. doing my radiation safety officer job here So, but yeah of course there are so many it's, it's a ever changing field and you cannot just yeah. stop at one point you know if you want to make it it has a bright future and there's a lot of things going on more with automation and of more course. like of course automation going to reduce the jobs of clinical medical physicists soon that <laughs> there will be less jobs because they are trying to do everything automated to get more precise information because cancer is such a thing you cannot just you know do any vague treatment you need to know where exactly the tumor is located so that you can do less damage to the cells so yeah. it has to be accurate and precise exactly well from my side i think i'm done and we can conclude the session thank you so much of vida for sparing thank your you. time thank you sharing uh, your experience with us I hope it's just nice uh, talking to all of you and hope I answered all your of your questions correctly. Uh, if we have a uh, I'm sorry to interrupt but if we have a scope for just one last question that just came up. <laughs> yeah, say it. Okay. Uh maybe if um uh, if Ms. Upvita or Dr. Uh, Nitendra can answer uh, that uh, is proton therapy uh, uh, less damaging than uh, x-rays? If yes, then why? Well, yes, proton therapies are less damaging than X-rays, depending on because of the quality of X-rays and protons. You know, you can read about it. There are so many research papers available these days, and it's still a new treatment, and they are still working on it. So, and the one reason which I understand is mainly because of its energy and the uh, yeah. size. and we can target it directly onto the lesion without uh, 
considering the whole area. So I think if more that about the quality of the particle, answer, more about say. the quality of the particle, the energies associated with X rays and protons. Exactly, proton is protons more protons are less, less damaging. And also the charge, if you see associated yes. with the it, it it's less deflecting and this sort of thing. Okay. I think we can uh, note down the other questions and uh, attach to the different platforms of IVNS because there are a lot of questions I still can see, but uh, we yeah. don't have much time now. So yes, thank you, Vida. Back to thank the you work. so much. I, yeah, sure. All the very best. And over to you, Dr. Preeti. So I would take this opportunity to conclude the section. Uh, Preeti, ma'am, do you want to add something? No, ma'am. All right. So uh, again, a big uh, sense of gratitude for Upvita, ma'am, and Nitendra sir for taking our time so and apprising us of all these uh, aspects and details of medical physics. Medical science has already proved its metal in this pandemic. And I'm sure medical physics is also playing a pivotal role in the same. So once again, thanks to all the panelists, all the participants, and thank you, Pritha, ma'am. Thanks. Thank ma you very much. Thank you, and uh, see you tomorrow for one more exciting session. Till then, take rest, take care, stay safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.